We are now in the final stretch of Lent, and next week is Holy Week. Why do we call it Holy Week? As Catholics, we see this as the holiest week of the year. It is the climax of the whole Lenten season, but it's also the holy preparation and the passion of our Lord for the greatest feast of all, and that is the resurrection, Easter Sunday. And so this Holy Week is a week set aside. And throughout the story of Christianity, throughout Christendom and our Catholic tradition, this is a week that Christians set aside out of the year to dedicate and focus on the spiritual, on our religion, on God. And so what makes Holy Week holy? That's the question we're going we're gonna to pursue tonight. Joining me this evening to talk about Holy Week is one of our professors here uh, at the Augustine Institute, Dr. Mark Gieschek, who is an Old Testament professor. And so, Mark, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I want to talk about Holy Week. And I, and I think about Holy Week, and I know you and I have both been to the Holy Land together. We oftentimes think of the Holy Land. We think of these places during Jesus' last days on earth where he is winning our redemption. Yeah. I think one of the best ways of thinking about Lent and Holy Week is as a journey, mm. right? That we're journeying toward the Lord, we're journeying uh, toward communion with Him. If you think about like what's our destination, well liturgically I think our destination is Mount Calvary, right? Mm. Our, our destination is the empty tomb. And, uh, and really if you think about like the, the way that we uh, orient ourselves in worship, right? It's toward the Lord, toward the altar, toward the crucifix, toward the tabernacle, and that if we think of the Mass as a journey, well, then also the liturgical season is a journey, and of course our whole life is a spiritual journey toward the Lord. Um, but I do think that there's a special way in which we can live out that journey by going on pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. So whether that's you know, going on a, a local pilgrimage or whether that's actually flying all the way to Israel, mm -hmm. going to the Holy Land and visiting the holy sites, there's a way in which we can kind of carry that journey in us throughout the year. And uh, there are miniature versions of it, right? Like the, you know, whether it's reading the gospel or praying the rosary, uh, or even walking with Jesus on the Stations of the Cross, yeah. right? Every one of these spiritual practices has a kind of uh, uh, a dimension of travel or journey where we're going from one place to another. And um, I think that, you know, when we think about Lent, oftentimes we're thinking of fasting and disciplines and, uh, you know, habit formation and, you know, making our lives better and this sort of thing. And um, I think those things are really wonderful, but if, if they're not properly oriented, they can just become a kind of like method of, self-improvement with a kind of Catholic flavor. Mm. And what we really want is communion with God, yeah. right? The whole idea right. of fasting and prayer and almsgiving is that we might be one with Him. Yeah. And, and really the whole journey of Lent, you know, which begins with those disciplines and fasting and prayer and so forth, leads up to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And so thinking through what Jesus was experiencing during that week, where He was going in the city of Jerusalem, and trying to kind of walk with Him uh, in prayer is really, I think, what we're trying to do when we really enter into the, to the mysteries of Holy Week. I like your idea of this idea of a journey and really trying to encounter Christ and grow in union with Him. And really the whole liturgical year follows the life of Christ, right? We go right. from Advent, which is preparing for His birth, Christmas His birth, and at the end of the liturgical year we end with the Feast of Christ the King, that He will come back mm -hmm. in the Second Coming and He will reign over all and put everything to rights. And, uh, and so the whole liturgical year in a, in a macro journey with Jesus. But what's special about Holy Week? It's the one week where every day we're following the footsteps of Jesus from his earthly life, right? His, his last days on earth, we kind of go through slow motion, starting with Palm Sunday. So maybe we start with why Palm Sunday kicks off this Holy Week. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, Holy Week can be a bit of a grind. Right? Yeah. It's a lot of long liturgies. Mm -hmm. And if you do the whole thing, right, you go to the Palm Sunday Mass, you go to Holy Thursday, you go to Good Friday, and you go to the Easter Vigil, you're in church for, I mean, it could be close to 12 hours that week. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty intense, you know, if you do the entire thing. But on Palm Sunday, we actually start outside the church. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that's just a, such a great metaphor for mm -hmm. Like what liturgy is all about, right? What our spiritual journey is all about. So we're actually on the outside. So liturgy is about being outside of church. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> it's we're 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 separated from God by sin, right? Yeah, and so we're on the outside, and we need to be brought in 
by His grace, you know, and, and we're led in by the Lord. On no, it, Sunday. it is a dramatic space for this idea of journey that you talk about, that totally. we start Holy Week outside of the church. With, with a mini pilgrimage, yeah. right? We're, yeah. we're as a congregation, we're journeying from the outside of the church to the inside of the church to be with Jesus. And um, while it's done in various ways, you know, and, 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 you know, there are many different liturgical versions of that journey, it's still a really powerful experience, mm -hmm. right? That um, what we're supposed to do is uh, place ourselves in the scene in the Gospels with Jesus, with the disciples, right? Where Jesus is riding on the donkey, right? And mm -hmm. we're working our way from the Mount of Olives into the city of Jerusalem. I want to I like that imagery, and I want to invite everybody to text us your questions if you have questions, as always, for our shows. So the text line that you can text your question is 720-650-0100, and uh, we always love to get your questions, and even if we can't get it on a particular show, we, we save them up, and hopefully we can get to them at another time. So please give us your questions and join the conversation. I think, Mark, um, I always think of the experience my first time of being on, a, on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And it really changed my experience of Holy Week because you go up to the top of the Mount of Olives and you do a procession down and you kind of follow the historical procession, more or less, of the route that Jesus took entering into Jerusalem and going to the temple. That's a powerful experience, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is because you're seeing the lay of the land from his vantage point, mm. right? And he knows what's going to happen. Yeah. And he's going there willingly right, with, with uh, the heart of a servant, right, to offer himself for our sake. And so I think that um, many times in life we don't really know what's ahead, right? And so we're, we're kind of disoriented about the future or at least just ignorant, right? But Jesus really knew it was going to happen. And when he's riding that donkey down and people are celebrating him, there's a kind of um, gravity to that, right, mm -hmm. where at the back of his mind, he's meditating on what's going to happen on Friday. Mm. He's not really thinking about the cheering or the hosannas or he knows the celebration. He knows that the, yeah, the, the winds are going to change by the end of the week, mm. um, and he's going to find himself on the cross. I know one of the places, uh, as you uh, pilgrims take that route down, you stop at a little church called Dominus Flevit, yeah. which means our Lord wept. And this is where he stops on that journey and weeps over Jerusalem. And Luke portrays this in Luke 19. And um, I just remember and many times stopping at that place, and it has a great view over the Temple Mount and over the city of Jerusalem. And our Lord stopping there and weeping, and it just, to be in that physical place and to see what our Lord saw, it brought that moment in a more powerful way for me to experience our Lord's sadness. Yeah, well, and, I mean, Holy Week is, is super emotional in this way, right? And emotionally jarring, where mm -hmm. at the same time that Jesus is being celebrated, he's also weeping. Mm. Right? And yeah. I feel like there's the, that can be really challenging for us to kind of experience in the liturgy of Holy Week where on Palm Sunday we, right, we read all the way through the Passion, yeah. right? And uh, we meditate on Jesus' death all week long and then we celebrate His resurrection. And, um, you know, earthly life has this kind of bittersweet character to it, right? Where we taste the bitterness of Jesus' suffering and death and we taste the joy of Easter Sunday. But somehow they're also kind of mixed mm. in our experience. And it clearly they were mixed in his as well. Mark, one of the questions people have as they experience Palm Sunday, because I think a lot of Catholics forget, okay, we're in Lent, and all of a sudden, oh, they're handing out palms. Oh, it's Palm Sunday. I mean, it's, yeah. it's one of those tangible events and experiences right. liturgically. It's like Ash Wednesday, sure. right? I mean, you get something yeah. <laughs> besides communion. I mean, it's like that marks that day. But I think a lot of Catholics get surprised, and then they're like, oh, yeah, this is that really long reading day in the gospel, right? <laughs> because it throws you off at first because you start, even before any of the prayers, with a gospel reading of Palm Sunday yes. outside, and right. then you make a procession with the palms into church. But then you're going to have the Old Testament readings, but then you're going to get another gospel, and this one is not only a double gospel, you're doubling down because you're reading the entire Passion narrative. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are like, why are we reading the entire Passion narrative? But Catholics need to know what's going to happen the next Sunday. Because you said we're not obliged to go to Holy Thursday liturgy or Good Friday, sure. um, but we are for the Sunday obligation. Right. So why do, why do we read the, the entire Passion narrative on Palm Sunday? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it helps prepare us for the week ahead, and it helps us remember that the whole week is devoted to meditating on Jesus' Passion, mm -hmm. right? Not just one or two days. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about like what we're supposed to do when we pray with Scripture, 
uh, we really are supposed to, to meditate on the words and their meanings, but, but when we're reading a scene, like in the Gospels, we're really supposed to kind of insert ourselves into the story, right? And mm. try to be as present to Jesus as we can be as we're praying through the scripture. And I think reading the, the gospel in a, this kind of elongated format in a kind of dramatic way with multiple readers actually really helps us mm. to do that, right? It actually helps us to pray and to really enter into the mystery of, of his passion. Well, when you talk about praying and, and entering into the scenes, that takes work, doesn't it? So how do we do that? Like, you know, do we need to set aside time? And what's the, people are like, what's the method? I, I open up my my Bible, I turn to the Gospel of Luke yeah. towards the end and find where the, the, the passion starts, where Palm Sunday starts. And then how do I enter into the scenes? What does that look like? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the great challenge and the mystery of prayer. But I think the main thing for us, slow down, mm. right? Like, it's almost like we would love to uh, be able to rack up prayer points or mm -hmm. something where we could like accomplish all these tasks when we get to prayer. The main thing we need to do and, and remember is just slow down. So we get to the, the text of scripture and we should probably just take a minute or two mm -hmm. or five or 10 of just quiet silence, not reading, just letting the thoughts of the day to dissipate and putting ourselves in the presence of God, right? That's a really important thing to remember when we come to read scripture prayerfully is that we actually wanna do it slowly. We really don't want to rush the process because if we rush the process, it's not going to work. So prayer isn't something that we just want to check off and say, task completed. It's a task we want to enter into. Is that, is that what I'm hearing yeah, you say? Yeah, I mean, that's the challenge, right? We only have limit, limited amounts of time to pray, mm -hmm. right? But still, when we do have that time, whether it's a five-minute, 15-minute, mm -hmm. hour-long slot, right, we want to enter into it properly. And so by slowing down first, mm -hmm. right, allowing ourselves to get recollected, right, to mm -hmm. collect ourselves, then we can be fully present to Jesus in the text, mm -hmm. right? And that really takes a lot of work in the imagination, yeah. right? So uh, that means we, we have to be thinking about the different characters in the scene, the lay of the land, where Jesus is standing, right, where I'm standing, and actually visiting the Holy Land is a great way to actually that build out your imaginative world to be yeah. able to do that. I do think you, it does take effort and time to, to use your imagination to enter into the scenes and, and to kind of picture it in your mind, right? So you're not just reading about Jesus on the donkey coming in, but you're trying to imagine what that would have looked like, right? Yes. And you're and entering into it. And, um, and there is an advantage, I think, of being there because I can think now, whenever I hear that he wept, I'm right there at Dominus Flevet, right? Right at that right. spot looking yeah. at Jerusalem. Um, so it's easier. So that, that's an advantage that pilgrims have. What if you, 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 people in the audience haven't had the chance to make a pilgrimage yeah. to the Holy Land? How could they get these scenes I in mean, their the head? What would you recommend? Is there any resources on formed? Well, of course, right, uh, which I'll mention in a second. But uh, the traditional way is through sacred art, mm. right? So if you go visit a, an art museum and you look at you know, medieval Catholic art, mm -hmm. most of it is about the passion, mm -hmm. and uh, most of it is very imaginative and about mm -hmm. kind of painting all the characters in the scene, putting yourself there. Uh, and so, you know, looking at sacred art is a great way to aid your meditation mm. on sacred scripture. And of course, on Formed, we have lots of wonderful resources, but the one I want to point to is our short video, it's only 30 minutes, on the Triduum. Yeah. Right? So the Triduum refers to the, the three liturgies uh, at the end of Holy Week, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil. And this 30-minute experience takes you on a very quick pilgrimage right, through the scenes of Jesus' passion and death from the Garden of Gethsemane and the Last Supper, all the way through the crucifixion and the mm -hmm. resurrection, the Via Dolorosa. Uh, and you get to really see what these sites look like today um, and have a kind of mini pilgrimage experience. I'll also mention that I make a cameo appearance, or that the younger version of myself makes a cameo <laughs> appearance in that video. Yeah. Um, so that's a really great way to, to be able to enter into the spirit of pilgrimage you know, when you can't visit at any particular time. And I know the feedback we've gotten from Triduum has been amazing. And people say, I've not been able to go to the Holy Land. Thank you so much for making this. It helps me enter in and see and yeah. experience what's there. And then others who've been on pilgrimage says, this brings back so many memories and this has been such a powerful tool. So people, whether they've been there or not, uh, people really love it. And I love the music and the meditative. It's, it's what you talked about before. Good prayer is not like fast food. It's yeah. gotta be slow. And Tritium moves at this contemplative pace. It's not rushed. Yeah. There's lots of things to see, but the music and the movement is, it, it kind of invites you into a pace of prayer. 
Yeah, and one of the um, beautiful scenes in it is from the Via Dolorosa, mm. right? From doing the Stations of the Cross, of the cross yeah. where Jesus actually carried the cross. Yeah. And um, it's, uh, it's such a strange experience, right? Because if you go during the middle of the day, right, it's just full of yeah. uh, busyness and vendors and shouting and all kinds of things. But as we went, right, yeah. very early in the morning, yeah. there's nobody on the streets. Uh, and you can just take that time with the Lord, journeying with him to Mount Calvary. And um, I think that, you know, whether it's watching that or whether it's praying the Stations mm -hmm. of the Cross, um, that idea of journeying with Jesus, mm -hmm. right, uh, through all these different stages is really what carries us through all of Holy Week. Robert asks, what's your favorite part of Holy Week or your favorite experience, I would add, to that in the Holy Land for Holy Week, uh, places yeah. in uh, the Holy Land that are part of the Holy Week story? I mean, for me, it's all about Easter, right? It's all mm. about the victory. So, I mean, the, the, mm. the Easter vigil to me is always the highlight. Mm. And it, I mean, it's like, it can be such a sac sacramental extra extravaganza, right? Where mm -hmm. you have baptisms and confirmations and first communions, and even I've witnessed a wedding at the, at the Easter vigil, you know? Right. And so the, the corresponding thing is being in the Holy Land and being in the tomb of Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it's just such a powerful experience, right? This is where it happened, right? This is where our redemption was accomplished. Mm. Right here is where Jesus rose from the dead. And so being able to visit the tomb uh, is really a, a moving and powerful experience. That is a powerful experience. I, gosh, there's so many for me over the years. I, I get an opportunity to lead pilgrimages, and so I've had so many great experiences in all these places. And there's so many that come to mind. Uh, one for me is the Cave of Gethsemane yeah. in the Garden of Gethsemane because here you're in a room that goes back to the first century and Jesus and the disciples would have been in that room. And that there's, few, there's no buildings really left from the first century. Right. Um, and so here you are in a room where Jesus and the disciples were. And it's called the Cave of Betrayal, as you, mm -hmm. as you know, and there's a beautiful uh, fresco and, uh, of Jesus praying there with his disciples. And there's an olive press uh, that they found in the cave that goes back to the first century. And of course, the Ge Gethsemane is an olive orchard. And so it's a wonderfully historical and important place. But praying in that cave of betrayal at, at you know, mass there is always moving to me. Um, thinking about Jesus being betrayed in the garden. Uh, praying in the Church of All Nations. We usually, in our pilgrimage groups, do right. an hour of adoration yeah. at night. At Gethsemane. At Gethsemane. Yeah. And that's always, gosh, that's oftentimes my highlight of each pilgrimage yeah. is praying that holy hour with our Lord who said to the disciples, pray with me one hour. Right. You know, to Peter, James, and John in that place. And uh, that's a real powerful experience. Any other experiences that come back to yeah, mind? Yeah, I mean, I mean, going to Mount Calvary obviously mm. is hugely yeah. important. And uh, I mean, this is uh, something you could do if you go on a pilgrimage, right? Which is you go up to Mount Calvary, you walk up these stairs, and there are all these chapels and things up there. But uh, there's an altar right at the place where the cross stood. And beneath the altar, there's a hole. Right, so you can reach your hand through the hole yeah. and touch the rock, right, right where the cross stood. And uh, I feel like that's such a powerful experience where mm. you're able to just have that physical contact, mm. right, to the rock where Jesus himself died right here. Mm. You know, there's something so tactile and, and, and sacramental about that. Yeah. I remember one year we were there and um, uh, one of the friars let us into the garden that's locked, you know, where you can see all these ancient trees. Yeah. And our small group was able to go in there and be amongst those trees and pray. And it was a full moon out and it was um, nighttime. And my, boy, I just, that was an experience I'll never forget because it just brought me yeah. to that time of Jesus praying in Gethsemane. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know, you know, it's like where these, it's like the stones cry out, you know, it's sort of how it feels yeah. when you're there where, um, I mean, obviously we can think about Jesus' passion at any time, but really being in the places where it happened uh, mm -hmm. has, a, has a way of moving our, our hearts and imagination in a, mm -hmm. in a way that's not available when we're just kind of sitting alone in our room. I mean, a, another fascinating place that isn't mentioned in Scripture is um, the cistern where Jesus was imprisoned right. on, on the night before uh, he, he was crucified. And, which this is found in the ruins of Caiaphas as the high priest's house. Right, which is now this church, St. Peter and Galicantu, and there's, but there's all of these wonderful like limestone layers underneath it, and Jesus was lowered into the sacred pit and was kept there all night long, at least according to tradition. And you can go into it, right? Yeah. And there's something where you can, you almost feel like you can like spiritually share in Jesus' mm. suffering, 
right? By yeah. visiting his presence in that, in that place. Boy, and praying Psalm 88, which is what the tradition of, of yeah. pilgrims there, which is, you know, I've been abandoned by my friends, uh, cast off by my brothers, and I'm, I'm in this pit. Yeah. And I cry out to you, O Lord. I mean, you could see that psalm was written for our Lord. Yeah. Uh, it was a great prophecy of his own abandonment and suffering. And to pray that, it's really hard just not to be deeply emotionally moved. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think this is where, mm. like, the value of the liturgy working through all these different stages and mm. steps and, and all the kind of drama of Holy Week, I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a little overwhelming. I find it, right? A little yeah, overwhelming, yeah. right? But the, but the power of it, right? Kissing Jesus' feet on the cross, right? Mm -hmm. Carrying the palms, right? Singing all of the songs, mm -hmm. shouting, crucify him, crucify him during the, the, yeah, the readings, reading, right? right? I mean, it's, it, I mean, there's so much drama built into the week, right? Even on Holy Thursday, right? When Jesus' disciples abandon him, right? And then we can keep vigil with him. And then entering the church that's dark during the Easter vigil. All of this is really meant to inspire us, right? Mm -hmm. To draw us in to the wonder and the mystery of Jesus offering his life for us. And while it's tragic and moving and sad, it's actually good news, right? It's Good Friday, yeah. right? Because he dies for us out of love. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not really a tragedy, right? Yeah. In the end, it's a story of great victory. And, um, and so I think carrying you know, that sort of note of hope and of joy with us through the midst of the passion and suffering of our Lord and really allow ourselves to enter into that the drama of the liturgy that week, I mean, it can be such a rich and powerful spiritual experience that we can carry with us throughout the year. There's so much to unpack for this, for this Holy Week, as you said. It, it, it's full of richness. And I think of, you know, Holy Thursday liturgy. We're reenacting Jesus' Last Supper. Right? Yeah. And so there's the foot washing. And that is such a powerful image for Jesus coming to serve. Yes. And uh, here he is on his last night, and he's not indulging He's giving and serving, and yeah. that's pretty remarkable. Friday, one of the remarkable things of the liturgy on, on, on Good Friday is we have this litany of petitions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, petitions are more serious uh, on the Good Friday liturgical service than on any other liturgy of the year. Right, right. And, yeah. and they're longer and they're more formal, and we have these formal prayers of petitions, and we're praying for travelers, for the sick, we're praying for the Jews, we're praying for... Uh, Everything under the sun, really. Uh, why all those petitions and prayers on Good Friday? Yeah, well, I mean, again, it kind of comes back to imaginative prayer. And like, what are we doing when we're seeking God, right? Mm -hmm. We're really approaching the cross, right? And we're asking, asking for the power of Jesus' blood to cover our needs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And to redeem the world in every dimension. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, bringing this especially long list of intercessions on Good Friday is a way of formally doing that liturgically, right? Where we're, mm -hmm. we're coming to the cross and saying, Father, this is what we need from your son. Please, like, give it to us, right? This is what we need. I love that image. And so you, you use the image of Jesus' blood. That's the atoning sacrifice for us. And in other words, this is the moment to go to the Father with all the petitions we have because it's a day of grace. Yeah. It's a day of mercy. It's the hour of mercy. Right, when the blood and water flows from his side, right? Yeah, He's the new yeah. temple, right? Giving us baptism and the Eucharist. I mean, it's so beautiful. You know, it would be easy, and I know this as a child, I would get bored at these long petitions. Oh my gosh, <laughs> when are these petitions going to stop, right? But I think in retrospect now, it's a waste that people don't realize why there's all these petitions at this moment mm -hmm. and that if you have petitions for somebody who's sick or needs conversion and renewal or um, this is the time to pray for that yeah. person with fervor, right? Right, this is the high point of the liturgical year, right? Yeah. And um, there's such a beauty to the way that the three liturgies all combine, yeah. right, of Triduum, that, that really we're supposed to think of them as one giant liturgy, right? Yeah, why don't we just explain what that word means, Triduum, uh, for people? Cause it, it, what is the Triduum exactly? Let's just simplify. You mentioned it quickly, yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I want a lot of people hear it, but they're like, what, what is it again? Right, so it's, it's, it's essentially the super liturgy, right, yep. of the church, right? It's these three, so three liturgies, all, all back to back, right? Holy Thursday evening, right? We have a special mass, right, that commemorates the Lord's Supper. And then Good Friday, we actually don't have mass, yep. which is kind of strange. We have the distribution of communion, but we don't actually have mass on Good Friday. Uh, and then we have the Easter Vigil on Saturday night. And all three of these liturgies are meant to be sort of experienced together, mm -hmm. right? There isn't a, a formal dismissal in the same way at the end One of the One leads Thursday. to the other, right? So right. 
on Holy Thursday, Jesus is anticipating his death by saying, this yep. is my body and blood, right? And then on Good Friday, he sheds that body and blood. Yep. And then on Holy Saturday, he's in the tomb, and then on Easter, he rises. And so the whole Paschal mystery is packed into those yes. three liturgies. And, and you'll notice, right, there isn't the same ending on Holy Thursday, and you don't really have a, the same mm -hmm. beginning on Good Friday, mm -hmm. uh, and there's no real ending on Good Friday. It's, it's yeah. kind of strange in that way that the, the liturgies feel different than a typical Sunday Mass. And it's, um, it's odd that on Good Friday and Holy Saturday, you can't have Mass until the Easter vigil. Right. 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 So that's, that's odd. There's a silence, a sacred silence. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite moments in the, in the liturgy of the Triduum is right at the beginning of the Good Friday service where the priest and the deacon and all of the altar boys and servers lay prostrate before the altar. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's such a powerful moment in our liturgy. That doesn't happen the rest of the liturgical year. The only other time I know of that that happens is during the ordination mass. Yeah. And um, it's such a great moment for us to realize the, the solemnity of the occasion, mm -hmm. right? And the gravity of Jesus offering his life for us. Um, and it's such a, I mean, such a wonderful like liturgical encapsulation of how serious this really is. We move from Palm Sunday with the palm branches that we're waving and, and shouting to Holy Thursday and we see the priests in Persona Christi then washing the feet yeah. of others, right, and serving. And Jesus gives that new commandment to love. And then on Good Friday, that there, we have the petitions and the prostration, uh, then kissing the cross, the veneration of the cross. And then on Easter Sunday, we start again outside right? In the dark. Yeah, with the fire. With yeah. the fire for the Easter Vigil. Right. And, uh, and, and then we, have, we, we light the candles and, we, and the church is dark and then the candles start to be lit. And so there's this idea of light with resurrection. That's an important image that we experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, I mean, it goes back to all of these beautiful themes in Old Covenant worship, right? So if you think of the lampstand in the holy place, you know, with the seven lights burning on it, shining on the bread of the presence, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Right, mm -hmm. so we ask, you know, Lord, let the light of your face shine on us. Mm -hmm. Right, that's really a reference to that ongoing liturgical occurrence of the light of the menorah shining on the bread of the presence. And we get a kind of new liturgical experience of that in the Easter Vigil, where the light of Christ, right, enters the church, right, and then illuminates all of our souls. I mean, it's such a beautiful liturgical experience. And you get that theme of light even on Easter Sunday morning, and this idea that Jesus rises before dawn or with the dawn, right? And that the yeah. light, he's the new light of a new creation. And, and there's a lot of hope in that. So one thing that might be worth reflecting on is like, what are you supposed to do in between all the mm. liturgies, right? A lot of times we have a little bit of extra time at home because we have days off during Holy Week or maybe at least Good Friday or half of Good Friday. What should you do at home? And, uh, you know, especially if you're fasting, right? Maybe you're not yeah. eating. What, yeah. You have a little, like a little bit of extra time. What should mm -hmm. you do? And uh, I think this is really a great opportunity for us to really re re revisit our prayer life, right? Yeah. And to maybe renew our prayer life with a little bit of silence, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of prayerful spiritual reading, um, and just time spent with the Lord thinking about Him and loving Him and just uh, calling to mind His suffering mm -hmm. and uniting ourselves with Him in quiet those quiet times at home. I think that's a great encouragement, Mark, because I think that uh, for our audience, what makes Holy Week holy is that we set it aside for God. Not for our pursuits. It shouldn't be a week that we go out to dinner and have entertainment. It shouldn't be a week where we're shopping. It should be a week where we kind of cease whatever worldly activities we can and to have that solitude, silence, and just to kind of reduce down so that we have that time for prayer meditation so we can go to the Holy Thursday Mass. It'd be great if you can go to daily mass. I mean, if there's any week of the, of the year to go to daily mass, it's Holy Week. And, uh, but certainly to go to Holy Thursday and then the Good Friday service. And then if you can, the great trifecta of the Triduum is, is the uh, Easter Vigil. If you go to that mass on uh, Saturday night, that's, that's a powerful, powerful experience of the liturgy. It's the greatest liturgical feast of the year or Easter Sunday. So uh, I, I really encourage you you know, whether you've been having a great Lent or you haven't been, Holy Week makes all the difference. You can make a, a great Lent even better. You can make a bad Lent redeemed by living deeply Holy Week. And that's why we wanted to get this program out before Holy Week to help you prepare for Holy Week. There'll be more resources on the form platform, so you can look for that for special th shows for each day of Holy Week. 
We also have a lot of extra uh, prayers and materials on our app, our prayer and meditation app called Amen. So if you just search Amen Catholic, you'll find our Amen app, and it's completely free and will always be free. And, uh, and we're grateful, uh, finally, for all of you who support our mission by joining the Mission Circle or being a donor to the Augustine Institute. Our Mission Circle members give $10 or more a month, and so many of you have joined during Lent, and there's been a matching gift during Lent. And I know that we're close to 1,000 people joining during the season of Lent, over 1,000 people. And um, I'm really grateful for everybody who's joined. And if you haven't yet, please become a member and really become a member of our mission and uh, support what we're trying to do by providing these things for free uh, to the world. So thank you so much, and we wish uh, the Lord's blessing upon you and that you have a very holy, holy week. God bless and take care.